All right, good morning. So today we're going to continue with the review. And I'd like to just have some quick reminders for everyone. So your lab zero part one is due tomorrow at 12 noon. Please make sure you submit in time. And the submission is going to be set to close automatically at 12 noon. So please make sure you submit in time and get your 100% for the, for the lab. And after that, your priority should be to really start with lab zero part two, which will be a little bit more demanding intellectually for you to digest the materials, especially how you can use the primitive array, which will be big, big focus for all the subsequent labs and also for uh, some later lectures, which we assume you know. So please study that well. And for yesterday, uh, if you didn't really attend the lab, that's okay. But I did some demos for both section E and section F about how to do helper methods. It's, I think it's a very useful subject. So these are the slides I already assigned you to, uh, I will assign you to read uh, for self-study for the review lecture. But if you really want to have some uh, Eclipse experience about it as well, and also know a little bit more about why we're doing helper method for good self-engineering principle, please refer to the recording. You got different example in both sections. Take the most out of it. Do you guys have any questions in general about the course before I start? We good? Okay. May not hurt just to do one minute's review of what we talked about last time. Okay, very quickly. So last time, we actually started a review, and then we actually uh, uh, talk about this diagram here. It's about object orientation, observe, model, execute. And of course, for this course, model execute will be the process, will be the sub-process we'd like you to really master. And we talk about OOP, especially refactoring, helper methods, right, in the in-lab demo. That's something you can refer to as well. And I will highly encourage you to really start doing refactoring in your lab exercises. It's definitely going to lead you a long way beyond this course. And we'll talk about the summarizing table just for, for you to see templates, attributes, behavior, or methods, and instance specific values, and et cetera, right? These are the important concepts for you to really know for any OOP you might do. And we talk about data types, right? We got to talk about the two rules. You can review them. And also, we talk about how you can visualize primitive attributes versus reference attributes. We're going to do more today, especially how we create objects and how we make a method call with some context objects. That's something we'll do today, for sure. And we talk about uh, null pointer exception. Right? Make sure you're aware of that. It may not be 100% avoidable, but at least when you got null pointer exception, you have to know how to deal with them. At least know why it's happening. And slide 16 to 47 is going to uh, are assigned to you for self-study. I'm going to cover most of the concept there in the little code demo I'm going to do right after the review. Right? But if you got any trouble understanding any part, reach out. Right. And we talk about parameters versus argument. And we're going to revisit uh, this part here pretty soon. Maybe today I have some exercise for you to think about, and we can sketch a solution together. And we'll talk about the scope of variable, also very important for you to realize, because you can easily run into compilation error in Eclipse, because you're using the variable in the wrong scope. Okay. That's basically what we discussed last time. All right. And today, I would like to resume by going back to Eclipse. Right. I'm going to start developing more into the uh, person example. Right. I'll come back to iPad in just one moment. But I would like to remind you very quickly. Okay? So if you go to the uh, study sites, you can see we already got an in-class demo from last time. Right? We talk about default constructor versus customized constructor. You should really know default constructor is only available if you don't have any constructors defined so far. As soon as you have the very first constructor of your own defined, default constructor disappears. Right? That's some, something we illustrate, illustrated last time. If you are not too sure about what this really means, please refer to the recording to make sure. They might be in the test or exam. Right? You definitely don't want to miss that important point. And you can download it and import it into uh, your Eclipse and start, uh, start with. And whatever I build up today, I'm also going to uh, uh, post it as a standalone project for you to uh, refer to. 
Let's go back to Eclipse. I'll do the attendance check for experiment once more, maybe uh, on the halfway through. So for now, don't worry. So I already imported the person's projects there, and let's take a look. So what we got is the person class over here, and what we were left off, let me, let me remind you. At the moment, this customized version of the constructor is commented out, it's not there. So that's why when you go to the person tester, you can see here the compiler doesn't complain because this one here being called is actually the default constructor, right? And now as soon as I introduce a, the very first customized or user-defined or programmer-defined constructor, I'm gonna comment it out, comment it back. And in that way, you can see as soon as I do this and save everything, I got some error. You can see the red cross, right? I got the uh, error. And if you move your mouse over, Eclipse very usefully tell you the, I'll read it out to you, it's a bit small. The constructor person taking no arguments over here is undefined because the default constructor disappeared, right? That's where we were last time. Make sure you really understand what's going on up to now. So what we'll do now is we're going to start defining more into this particular example. Let me just move my iPad a little bit closer to me so it'd be easier. Bear with me. Okay, that's good. So what I want to do now is let's now try to develop this particular customized version here. Let's define this first and then we'll call it appropriately so we can fix the error. So in this constructor here, we have person which should match the name of the class. That's a rule, you have to follow it. You cannot have arbitrary name for the constructor. In some programming languages you can, but not for Java. And for now, I deliberately choose two parameters, new weights and new heights, with different names from the attribute names, weights and height, deliberately. I don't want to cause any confusion just yet, but I'll do that after some quick illustration. So if I got new and new height, now I would like to use this input value here to initialize this attribute weight. I would like to use the second input here to initialize the height. That's what I would like to do, right? Easy. I want to say uh, weights attributes is assigned to new weight. And also the height is assigned to new height. Everybody comfortable with it? Okay. One thing that's very useful, I would like to highlight to you in Eclipse or any IDE. Pay attention to the color of the font here. You can see here the weights here is blue, which matches the color of the attribute over here. So Eclipse is telling you when you are referring to this particular variable here, it's really referencing the class level attribute over here. This is actually very useful. Sometimes you might be wondering where, this, where does this variable come from? So Eclipse tell, is telling you. On the other hand, the new weights and new heights, they are of a different color. So now if you put the new weights, it's telling you new weights comes from this new weight as a parameter, right? It's very useful information ID is telling you, right? Okay, all good. And what I want to do now is to go back to the person tester over here, and then I want to do a little bit more. So now for new, let me just change the name of the person. How about that? So they'll be matching more on the slides you have. Let's say, if I say person Jin, a new person, and then I would say 72, 1.81. So our assumption is 72 is 72 kilograms. 1.81 is 1.81 meters high, okay? And let me create a second object. Person Jonathan, new person here, and I'll say 65 kilograms and 1.67. Height. Right? And then, of course, what I want to do is I want to print out Jin and Jonathan. And at this point, you can see there is no error. We fixed that default constructor issue, right? Because after we have defined the customized constructor over here, we follow consistently the required type for input number one and input number two. That's what we have done. Right? It's very basic, you should know. 
If you're still struggling at this level, see me in the office hour or appointment. You really want to get it straight. Okay? And we, last time we asked one of you, actually answer perfectly, when you try to say system the other print line. And here, Jim is referring to this particular Jim. It's a reference variable. When you try to print it out to the console, it's not going to print out anything to do with 72 or 1.81. Instead, it's going to print out the references, all right? It's important, but so let's, let's now take a look. I would like to show to you. Let's now do a first run. If I simply click on run, the console is showing to me, these, this is the address for Jim. This is the address of Jonathan. One thing you should note, these two addresses are different because they were created using two separate keywords, new over here, okay? Now, let's go a little bit deeper. How can we use the breakpoint and debugger to help us to see why they are different objects? Let's play around a little bit. I really uh, like you to learn about debugger. When you are in the programming test, you will be building the uh, application on your own. Who might be your best friend? Not Jackie, not the TAs. Nobody's gonna tell you anything. Debugger, you really need debugger to help you, okay? And for this particular easy part here for the constructor, maybe I wouldn't use any JUnit test just yet. Let's just use console tester. Once I get to the uh, use of this keyword, I will use the JUnit test. Let's so get a variety. What I want to see is, let's put a breakpoint here, line number six, okay? And then I'm going to launch the debugger. And of course, if you want to be very sure you're launching the debugger on the right class, Go to, oh, by the way, a very common mistake. If you right click on the person class, which is over here, the person class all is a template. You can never debug a template by itself because the template itself is not executable. What's really executable is in either in a JUnit test or console test where you try to create different objects in a sequential code, right? So now, let me illustrate you. If you right click on person, run as, no Java application option. Debug as also no Java application option, right? That's something I saw one of your classmates making the mistake during the last session. You might want to be aware of that. Instead, I'm going to right click on the person tester, which does have some executable code in the main method. I'm now gonna debug as Java application. And of course, it's gonna ask me to switch to the debug, debugger perspective, I'll say switch. Okay, now I'm here. Now, I'm basically pausing a line number six. At the moment, you can see under variables, Jin and Jonathan don't exist just yet because I'm pausing right in the beginning of line number six. It has not been executed yet. And one thing I can do, if you really want to see whether or not the person constructor is really doing what it is supposed to do, what you can do is you can say step into. So one of the options here is step into. If you step into it, it's going to show you now I'm going to execute a person constructor that's customized, right? And then you can see at this point, you can see the value for the various attribute value, or the various variables. For example, the weights, which is the attributes, right now if you move your mouse over, it's showing to you 0.0. .0. It is still the default value. It has not been initialized yet. On the other hand, the parameter new weights is actually 72.0. That's something we gotta initialize into, right? Just understand what's going on here. And you can also verify that under variables here. You can see this over here is referring to the objects we are talking about. We're creating these new objects. At the moment, under this, you can see heights and weights are both zero. On the other hand, the parameter or the arguments are uh, already the value we want to assign to. Let's now try to step over. If I step over line number 20, let, look what's gonna happen. If I do that, Eclipse shows to you the weights has been changed, right? It has been initialized to whatever parameter we are passing. And if you try to step over again, it also initialize the heights. That, that's what's really happening. Don't think this is too complicated. It really makes logical sense about what's happening here. So when I sometimes trace the code, I may have to also go this much detail for us to understand what's going on. In your case, starting from lab number one, 
Sometimes you might be failing a particular JUnit test case. What should you do? Put a breakpoint in the beginning of the test method and try to go over line by line. For each line, you want to see if the variables are changing the way you're expecting. If any line, the first line that's not changing, on, uh, not changing as you expected, that's where the error is and you want to fix it. Right? If you're still struggling with this concept, come to me and then I can show you some example. But we are good for now. Let's now step over again. And now after this, you can see for Jim, it's not an object. You can see the weights and heights has been uh, initialized properly. All right. Let me show you one more thing. And now we are in line number eight. So up to this point, we have already initialized Jim and Jonathan. So if you look at the variables here, Jim and Jonathan, they are of different objects because addresses are different. Let me show you something even more useful. There is one tab over here called expressions. Oh, if you don't see it, easy, window, show view. And then you can find expression over here. That's how you show it in Eclipse, right? Just in case you need it in the lab or then in the programming test. Now, if I want to know about Jim, it's already there. I can also say, I want to know about what's Jonathan. I can just type. It tells me Jonathan is of this particular address. Now, are they the same objects? Meaning that are they the, are they the same address with different addresses? I can also do that. Jin equal equal. False. They are not the same objects. Another one, just one more. What about I say Jin is not the same object as Jonathan. Explanation mark equal. True. All right? Guys, any questions so far? If you are kind of following, but not exactly, so that's why you really want to maybe revisit this part and redo everything on Eclipse, right? All right, I think I'll go back to iPad, make some summary, and then we can move on to the keyword this, which is important. Stop here and make sure every time, let's say you want to stop the debugging process, you want to go back to Java, please make sure you click on that stop button. If you don't click on that and go back to Java and st start editing your code, Eclipse is going to crash. Okay, I saw a few of the examples already. So I already stop it, and I'm going to switch back to Java perspective. All right? Okay. Uh, when you see the slides, you will see that I also included some GUnit test case over here for you to look, uh, look into, right? I'll leave that to you. That one should be quite straightforward to follow. Let me summarize very quickly. We got a template person, we got two attributes, we got constructor here. Well, this is just another one I'm defining. I can define to say, I want to have some constructor here, pretty much like the default, which will do nothing. It's up to you if you want to have that one. You can get rid of it if you want to. But this is the one that we look at together, right? And again, when we talk about parameters versus argument, again, let me just make a quick notes. For example, this guy over here, new weights, is a parameter. And when we are calling 72, and when we are calling 65, these are the arguments, right? And then that's how they get connected. So important for you to know, right? That's what we said about last time. And now, let me just, since I got a memory diagram here, let me just trace at a low level just one time. And then we're going to see how we can trace more effectively for a more complicated code. So here, after Jim and Jonathan being created, right, what's going to happen is we have Jim. Both of them are reference variable. So you have Jim over here. Also, you have Jonathan over here. Sorry. They should be storing addresses, but well, each one of them should be storing an address. So what's happening, roughly speaking, is like this. So there might be, let me just move Jonathan away a little bit. So there is some part of the memory, maybe this one is 0, 6, 1, 2, 3. And there's another part of the memory, maybe 0, 6, 8, 2, 9. I'm making that up, but you'll see the point. 
And when we first created this particular object over here, we are saying that for this object, we're going to store 72 and 1.81. So maybe 72 and 1.81. And when we are creating this object over here, we are saying that we want to store 65 and 1.67. So 65 and 1.67. But these values that I just mentioned, they are not really stored in here or here. No, it's not the case. Make sure you don't understand that way. What's going to happen is this address will be stored in Jin. And similarly, this address here will be stored in Jonathan. So this is why when you look at the comparison that we did, for example, here, we say Jin equals Jonathan, right? When we do this one, for example, equal, equal. Now, is this address the same as this address? No, false. That's why. So this will be the lower level view of seeing things, which you might like because it's very precise. However, remember the exercise I sent to you yesterday? For those of you who look at that, for example, with a complexity like that, you don't want to really trace this way. It's going to cost you uh, trouble, too slow. That's why we have to learn a more effective way. In some ways, a little bit more abstract way. We can, filter, we can forget about the memory address detail, but we can do it more efficiently. That's something we'll do later today. All right, any question about initializing the objects? We're going to trace still a little bit more later. Okay? Any questions so far? Already. And what I want to do now is asking you guys this question so we can properly see one of the useful usages for this keyword. Right, maybe something you have seen in first year, but it's good to review. Now, the same template person, weights and height, the same. The only thing I have changed is this. Rather than calling that new weights, I call that weights. Sorry, I should have done this before the class. I beg your pardon. So let's now do that very quickly. H-E-I-G-H-T. Okay. And then at the same time, you can think about what if I make this change? What's going to happen? Now it's fixed. So the only changes I've made is, rather than calling the parameter name new weights, now I call that weights, which matches the name of these attributes. Also, I call this heights, which matches the name of these attributes. Now, anybody want to share your insights? What's going to happen here? First of all, is Eclipse going to tell you this is an error? Not really. Because you're still in some way assigning a variable to a variable. But are you really doing something useful though? Anybody want to uh, share insight? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, somehow we're referencing to the same variable, right? Okay, let me uh, elaborate a little bit for everybody else. This may be a common mistake if, if you forgot. What's happening here? Oh, you know what? Just before I uh, annotate anything. Let's use Eclipse to also give us something useful, which I want to show to you. So let me go back to the person class over here. OK, let's do the change again. So rather than calling this new weights, let me call that weights. And let's call that height. And then also call that weights accordingly, because new weight is no longer there. Number one. There is no red cross, so there's no compilation error. So you can still submit this as is for your lab or for your programming test. No error. Number two, it may not be doing something very useful because let's say for this line here, think about what you really intend to do. What you really intend to do is to initialize this particular weight attributes by this input value weights, but they happen to have the same name. Can you really do that by just executing this line? Doesn't seem like, because remember what I said before, Eclipse also highlights the variable very usefully for you. If you simply, let's say, oh, sorry. 
if I fix for you. Okay, let's not worry about the fix just yet. If you move your mouse over the weights over here, single click on that, you can see weights is referring to the parameter. So we are not really assigning to the attributes. We are assigning to the parameter itself. That's not what we want to do, right? And then the weights over here is also referring to the weights over here. You can see this one is also highlighted. So we're basically assigning weights to itself without ever touching the weights over here. Confusing, I agree, but that's happening. This is a phenomenon called shadowing. Not too sure you've heard about this term. Okay, let me mention that. Okay. We'll come back to the fix a little later. When this is happening, number one, you have to know that this line over here does not initialize the attributes weights. Does not over here. It's not being initialized. And instead, the parameter which was declared called weights, I'll just say W here, is assigned to itself. That's what's happening. And this is something called shadowing. Or if you want to make it clear, variable shadowing. Okay, let's try to see if I could, you can understand that visually. So here we got the same name over here. Let's say you got weights over here, you got weights over here, you got weights over here. The way to think about it, let me try to do my best. Think about this thing over here is basically like an umbrella, it's covering everything underneath. Covering underneath, right? It's like a blockage, right? Like a, sh like a shelter over there. Now, when you are here underneath the umbrella, are you able to see this attribute here? You're not because you got blocked by the umbrella, right? It's called shadow. And also, is this weight, can this see the weights over here? Also not because you're blocked by this parameter. That's why both occurrences of this weight over here are really referring to the same weights parameter. So it is not an error, but it's not doing something correct. All right, so we okay about the uh, shadowing? A little bit informal coverage over here, but if you look at the formal definition, it may not make too much sense, but I thought this might be the best way for you to see what's going on, okay? Now the question is, how do we fix this? You might say, why don't we rename weights back to new weights so we don't have the name clashes? I agree, that might be a good way to do it. And you can feel free to do so for your constructor whenever you're designing your own code. However, the drawback for this approach is you may have to come up with uh, different names every time when you define a constructor. Wouldn't it be nice if we can simply call the parameter name just matching the attribute that we want to initialize? And at the same time, we want to be able to refer to the attribute itself and break through the umbrella, the shadowing. It would be nice to have such solution. With what we got so far, it's not possible. So what do we need? This, all right? So you can see the whole logic here, right? And assuming that everything's good, let's now go to the second version. I'll talk about uh, the visualization in a moment. So what we need to do is this. We want to introduce the this keyword Let's talk about the, uh, the very simple use of this. We will see the more complicated use of this maybe on Tuesday next week, okay? So if we added this over here, this disambiguates the weights. So th think about this. When we talk about the weights over here, we still have that umbrella, the shadowing. We still have it. But now, if you actually got this, the weights, if that's what you got. That one guarantees you can break through the umbrella and then go all the way to this particular weights. 
That's how you fix it. So whenever you use the, this keyword, it tells you, it tells the compiler, I want to refer to the attributes, the class level variable. Okay. And then let's fix now back to the Eclipse code. And then I'll do a little bit tracing together with you. So you can think about that this keyword here indicates that the class level weights is referred to, is being referred to. Right, the disk keyword. That's the, usually the first uh, application of the disk keyword you will see. But there will be more interesting use, which we'll cover a little bit later. Okay. Let's now go back to Eclipse. So the way to fix this will be this dot weights and also this dot height over here. Good. And now notice what's happening here. If you move your mouse over the weights here, it's still referring to parameter. If you move to the high here, it's still referring to the high. That's okay, because we want to use those values. On the other hand, go to the left hand side of the assignments. Now, if we click on this weight here, it's now no longer referring to the weights here, which we used to have because of shadowing. Now it's referring to the weights of the attribute over here. That's the magic this will do for you. Everybody good about this? Okay, good. And I'd like to talk about something else. Let's say we got things over here, and now how do we trace the code? Right? Now, I don't really want to go back to this nice, sophisticated memory approach. That's too inefficient. Correct, but inefficient. What I would like to introduce to you, there's also one of your slides. I forgot the number, but you can look it up. How do we visualize the object? So here it tells you the rule. You can look, read through it, but this will be how you can visualize an object in general. The name you put over here is the reference, uh, reference variable. And there's a box, you can see, rectangle box. And what you put is the title of the box over here is the name of the template or the name of class, which is declare type of the variable. So the fact that you have Jim and person, that means somewhere in your code you must have, okay, let me just uh, choose it over here. That means somewhere you must have declare person and then Jim, somewhere, all right? So it's really important to indicate which, objects you're, uh, which type of the object you're talking about. It's important. And this column here are the attributes for that particular template or class. So these are the attributes. All right? And these over here are the instance specific values. instance specific values. All right, that's how I would suggest you trace the code. But I'm gonna do this, oh, it's good I didn't cross that. But I'm gonna do this throughout the course, okay? To me, this will be the easiest way and the most intuitive way for you to really draw objects. And the arrow over here, I cannot emphasize more the arrow over here tells you Jin only store the address. It does not store the entire objects. All right. Any question about this uh, way of drawing? We're good? Let's now uh, practice that. Let's now move on to this particular code here. I do want to break it down for this line here, just for you to understand completely what's happening over here, just for this one here, okay? Just for this line. Let me write it down. Person, J, 
gym equals new person, 72, 1.81. Let's analyze this line very carefully. I'll do it in the following order. This part here is done first, number one. This part here is number two. This part here goes last, number three. All right. What does number one do? Easy, you're declaring a variable, right? Reference variable. Number one, basically declaring a reference variable, Jim. Okay, so let me just put Jim here, just for now. Put it aside. And let's not worry about just having a box anymore, right? We don't need that. That's too low level. What about number two? Number two, you're basically creating an anonymous object. Anonymous means it's an object with no name, with no variable storing its address just yet. It's brand new. Nothing is referring to it. Anonymous objects. And one th look ahead, which I'll mention next time. In Java, it will be allowed if you just want to write this as an expression alone. You don't necessarily have to always assign this to something else. You don't have to. That's something we'll see, which is a very useful application uh, for you to apply. All right, so how do we visualize number two? Well, number two, we're going to follow what I just showed to you over here, right? We're going to need a box. So what we have is we're going to have a box over here. And because we are creating an object of type person, so I'm going to put person here. And according to the template definition for person, I got weights and heights, right? So at the left column here, I can have weights and height. Weights and heights, okay? And then you can see the arguments I'm passing is 72 and 1.81. How do we trace this? In order to trace these two values over here, because this is calling the constructor for the person. So we have to step into the person class. Specifically, we're gonna step into the person constructor over here. Okay? If you step into this person constructor over here, now, what does this here really means? That this here is really referring to this particular object that we are creating, which has no name just yet. But that's really what this really means, the context objects. The context object we are talking about right now is the one that's being created. Okay? So let me make a little bit even more uh, connection. So the, 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 the two, this keyword here is really re referring to this. Okay? All right. And then let's say once we got it, this over here, and what we need to do is these two assignments. So now assignment number one. When we say this dot weights is assigned to weights. All right? What's this dot weights? This dot weights is referring to the weights of this current object. We want to assign that to the weights, which is 72. That's what we're doing. Okay? So we're going to put 72 over here. And similarly, what about this the heights is assigned to heights? Well, this the heights is assigned to the height, the argument here, that's 1.81. That's how we create this object here, right? You also gotta get used to whenever we wanna step into the constructor, and later on, access a mutator, which I'll do one more time in the next page. That's step number two. So now we have done step number one, step number two, right? But now there's no connection whatsoever between the, uh, the variable and the anonymous objects. So that's why the equal sign here for assignment is so important. So what's going to happen is once you execute the purple part over here, 
is basically going to say, Jim is pointing to this object here. So that's why I said the arrow here, it is so important here. So the pointing to over here is really referring to storing the address of the newly created objects. Guys, right, any question? Okay. I hope I'm not confusing you, right? I'm hoping. Good. Okay. If you think that's clear, good for you. All right. And let's now go for one more tracing and then we are done with the demo. Okay. What I would like to do now is let's not worry about Eclipse just yet, just save time. All the code is available on the, um, uh, on the iPad. You can feel free to turn them into uh, your projects, okay? Let me just put, put for you so you will know what to do. I have some exercise for you. Okay, finish developing the accessor and mutator. All right, I'm just saving some typing for myself, if you don't mind. We can save some time. Good. So now let's take a look at this, okay? And then we'll do one more tracing quickly, and then we'll take a short break. And then we got more fun stuff to talk about, okay? All right, so now let's talk about this here. So person class, oh, sorry. Person class, the two attributes, and assuming that we also got a constructor, I just don't have space to put it. Let's say we've got two methods here. This is an accessor which returns a double, okay? We're simply calculating the BMI, okay? And the formula is, I'll put it aside for you. So BMI is the weights divided by the height squared. And the assumption is the weight should be measured in kilograms and the height should be measured in meters, which is exactly what we assume for our attributes. So we have no inconsistency. All right, so that's the accessor, right? So weights divided by the square of heights. Do you have to use a math class to calculate power of two? Not really necessary. Just multiply twice, right? It's easy. Then return BMI. We got another mutator which has void, right? So this method does not return anything. Instead, it's actually going to change the attribute weights over here by this much. Okay, that's what's happening. And this is a JUnit test case to nicely illustrate by making the same method call I want to show to you. Get BMI, get BMI, get BMI, get BMI. So we're calling get BMI four times. Each time is going to give us different answer. Let me summarize quickly and then we'll trace. If you compare these two. Because the context objects are different. So get BMI, get BMI will give you different answers because the weights and heights for Jim and Jonathan are different. And even more, if you compare this one here and this one here, the same method being called, the same context objects, but are they going to give you the same result though? It could be, but not in this case, because there is some mutator call here, which will modify in between these two lines the attribute values that's gonna impact the calculation of the formula involving the weights. That's why, even though these two lines are exactly identical, but because the object itself has been modified for its attribute values, so this second call is gonna give you a different result. All right, so what I said about how to compare these four lines are so important, right? Let's now trace them quickly. All right, so now the first two lines, easy. So let's say Jim here and Jonathan here, right? So now I'm gonna do it the way I think you should do in your normal test. Let's be quick, right? You want, time is uh, really your uh, most valuable asset you know, in, the, uh, in the test. Let's try to do that. Okay, Jim, what's gonna happen is Jim is going to point to this object here, 72, 1.81, 72, 
1.81. And in the test, I would suggest maybe don't, you don't need to bring color pens like what I'm doing here. I saw students used to bring color pen highlighter for their test. Pretty good, but you know, it's just on the sketch paper. You don't need it, all right? Pencil will be okay. Second line, we got Jonathan which stores the address of this object here, pointing to it. And then we got 65, 1.67. Right, so these are the most efficient way to trace. Of course, you gotta draw the box yourself. All right, let's now get to the first one. If I get to this line here, Jim da get me a mine. You can see the context object here is Jim. And we're calling the getBMI method. So getBMI is defined over here. So we are walking, we're stepping into this for the first time, getBMI. Now it's important, how do we understand this uh, method called execution here? What's this? This should be the context object of the method called Jim. Conceptually, think about we are replacing every occurrence of this by Jim for this particular method call. Once you have done that replacement, it will be so obvious what you should do. So what's happening here is, when you say jim.getBMI, you're basically boil, boiling down into jim.weights divided by the square of jim.heights, which is over here. Agree? Okay, that will calculate some number, which you don't need to worry for now. Right? Just gonna calculate. What's gonna happen if we try the second line? Jonathan Daguerre BNI. We're calling the same method the second time, but now the context object is Jonathan, different, but the same block of code is being called. So we're calling this method here for the second time. Now, every occurrence of this will be replaced by Jonathan instead. So for this particular execution, what end up being executed is Jonathan that weights divided by Jonathan the high square, which will give you a different number, right? You can see the same pattern of execution is being called, but the specific value that we have to apply depends on the context objects, right? Are we good about this trace here? Okay, I hope that makes sense. Let's do one more, and then there will be some exercise of tracing for you. Okay, one more. What about here? Let's say we want to execute these two mutator calls. So Jim the gain weights, right? For this particular method call here, the context object here is Jim, and we are executing this mutator for the first time, right? And by the way, the three here is the argument. Of course, you can replace the amount just by three if you want to, all right? And then, Jim is this, the context object. So every occurrence of this will be replaced by Jim. So what this is trying to do is, Jim.weights, which is over here, should be assigned to Jim.weights, which is 72, plus three. So that should be updated to 75, right? If you try to trace again, this line over here, you can simply do the same thing. I'll let you do it. That'll be Jonathan that weights, is assigned to Jonathan that weight plus three. 68, all right? After this, if you try to call these two accessors again with Jim and Jonathan, you can see now the calculation will be based on 75, 1.81, 68, 1.67, so they're different, right? So this is a very typical pattern for OOP because between accessors, uh, accessor method calls, you have some mutator calls to modify the, we call the state, or attribute value for your objects. So that's why, usually just by looking at the code, it may not be so easy to see the consequence of each individual call. You have to trace it like this, right? That will be what I want to demo in terms of the code. And any question for this? 
clear to everybody? Okay. You guys are shy, but I will take silence and yes, you're fine. But you know, try to really uh, learn this if you haven't learned it. Uh, also try to also use this as a basis as you follow through part two, right? You also need something a little bit more complicated, which will be taught in part two of your lab zero. Let me just do uh, very quickly two more things on the page and then we'll take a short break, okay? So we're done with the code demo. And then uh, what I would like to do now is starting from slide number 48. Remember slide 16 to 47 is for self-study, right? It's not slide 48. I want to give you some idea about how you are supposed to use accessors versus mutator. Okay, here. Let's take a look. So we have the person class or template. This one here returning nothing. So it's a mutator. On the other hand, this one is returning something. So by definition, it is an accessor. Now I'm not interested in tracing. I want to show to you what can be an error, what can be something that, that is not an error, but not very useful, all right? Let's consider line by line. Line number one. Let's say I want to print out something. The value I want to print out is what's return of Jim that set weight, 78.5. Is this okay? Yes or no? No. no. How come? It's, it's void. It doesn't return anything, right? You can only make use of the value of a method call if that method returns something. But now the problem is set weights does not return anything. Void. So it's not acceptable. So if you look at your slide, it's going to tell you, it's going to give you, oh, sorry, it's going to give you an error. All right, it's not acceptable. So the point is, whenever you want to make use of some value, either for printout or use that to assign to something else, it cannot be a mutator call, cannot. What about, well, the second one is similar, right? So now if you take a look at here, I want to do some variable assignments. And I want to assign some value into W. Can I specify Jim that set weight is the value? Again, I cannot, because that one there doesn't return anything, right? Similar. So this one here, again, returns void according to the definition. So if you reveal it, it's going to be also no. And the only way that's correct is when you say, I want to set Jim's weights standalone. Don't assign it to anything or don't, don't try to print it out. That's, that's okay, right? That's the only way you can use legally the mutator. And let's now take a look at these. Let me start with the second one. So I say I want to print out gym.getBMI. That one is okay. Because according to the definition, gym.getBMI is returning a double. Can I print out a double? Of course I can, right? So this is fine. Similarly, can I assign a double here, which is a return value, to another double variable? Of course I can, right? That's also fine. Now, how about the first one? This one's interesting. There are two questions here. Number one, does it compile? Number two, is it useful? Two question here. How about we start with the first one? Does it compile? It does. Funny enough, actually, <laughs> it compiles. And yet you can try that. You know, if you simply say, I want to call an accessor method as if it's a mutator, standalone, it compiles. All right? I want to make it clear. It compiles. Question number two Is it useful? 
Now really, basically you're saying that, okay, now please calculate the BMI for me. And once you you're done, I don't care. I don't really use it. I don't really use it for assigning to some, someone else. I don't use it to print it out. So it's useless. You're not using it, right? But the return value, not used. That's the problem. Okay, that's uh, one thing I'd like to go over with you. One more, and then we'll take a short break. Method parameters. This will be slide number 49. Um, this is more about design, right? I think uh, in your labs and in your programming tests, for all those require classes and require methods, you have no choice. You have to follow what JUnit test is telling you to define. However, you might find yourself sometimes wanting to create an extra helper or extra methods for your, uh, for your development. It's absolutely fine. You can definitely feel free to uh, define additional methods. Now, for your additional methods, what will be the principle of putting parameters, right? As a beginner or maybe even intermediate uh, programmer for Java, you might still be struggling a little bit. I would say this is more like a software design challenge over here. What kind of parameter should I put? So here I just put some principle for you. So whenever you want to think about what kind of parameters or input you want to put for constructor, basically you want to think about what attributes do you actually want to initialize? Because whatever you don't really initialize, they will be left as default values. That's the principle, okay? For example, let's say for the person class constructor, I can choose to say I want to have parameters, weights and heights. These are the input values I want in order to initialize the attributes. Or I can say I want to initialize maybe first name and last name, right? It's kind of up to you. Depends on what you need. What about mutator? Similar, because mutator is really supposed to modify the attribute values somehow. So now in this case, if I want to maybe modify certain X or Y, oh, we're talking about two-dimensional point. So maybe in this case, you may, you may want to modify, for example, the y value. In that case, you just need to supply that particular value, right? Depends on what you really want to modify. Then you put that in the parameter. Finally, when we talk about accessor method, it's really about executing some computation on the context objects. So think about what kind of extra information do you need from whoever is calling the method, then ask them for it. So if I want to get, I want to know what's the distance from the current point to another point. You gotta tell me what another point is. So that's why it's a parameter, okay? So just uh, have this kind of principle sheets handy and then it, it will also take some experience and uh, uh, to really see a different example to really get the idea. So, but that's just a design principle for you. Any question about this? Okay, good. And why don't we, why don't I, first of all? All right, so before the break, we talk about these uses, accessor, mutator, method parameters. Please take a look. And alias, okay? This is such an important topic, so I want to go very slowly, make sure everybody's okay, before we see that exercise, okay? Let's do something very basic. Reference aliasing only applies to reference variable. Yes, that's why, it, that's why it's called reference aliasing. However, I would suggest, let's start with primitive type just to get everything clear, even for the primitive side, okay? Yeah. All right, let's get something very basic, understood. That will prepare you for that exercise I posted yesterday, but we'll do it together. Let's say we got Integer i is assigned to three. Primitive, right? So this page here, we don't talk about aliasing just yet. Actually, to be, to be, to be precise, this will be primitive, this will be where aliasing is happening. Okay, let's do primitive first. Let's try to trace the code. Let's start with line number one. When I say i is initialized to be three, the way to visualize it will be i is a storing three. Easy, huh? What about second line? Let's say J is assigned to I, 
All right. How do I assign I value to J? How do we do that? What's happening here is we've got a new variable J over here, and then it's going to copy what is stored in I over here into J, which will be three. So now we've got two copies of the same value, three. May sound trivial to you, but it's going to help you understand aliasing. All right? When we get there. All right, so now if you say I equals equals J, well, that should give you true. All right? And let's do another one. If I do, let's say K is assigned to three, right? We're basically having. Yeah, if we're having another variable k over here, that would be also three. So now we got three copies of the same value, separate copies. And now if you say k equals equals i, for sure, three equals three, and k equals equals j, that's also true. So true and true is true. Are we okay with that? Of course, the only thing you have to know is what this really means. It means Conjunction, and right? Both sides must, must be true. We'll get to some interesting uh, use of the n percent uh, logical operator later, okay? But for now, you don't need to worry. Let's now do something similar, but now let's now switch the context to reference variable to see how things might change slightly. Number one, this one. So according to our way of tracing, P1 is pointing to an object of type point. And every point, assuming that we got x and y, x and y, okay, and then we got 2 and 3. All right, that's the first line. Easy. By the way, how do I know I should got x and y and also assign accordingly? You should really refer to the definition of the constructor. That's something I'm assuming, all right? Second one. This one's fun. Now, what does that mean? Can anybody tell me what does that line mean? Just don't tell me assign P1 to P2. I can read it too. But what does that really mean? So we're assigning the address of P1 to P2. We are assigning the address of P1 to P2, pretty much, yes. Or let me paraphrase it in a slightly different way. That could be a little bit more useful. We are basically storing whatever that's in P1 into P2, okay? What does that mean diagrammatically? Are we creating a new object? Not really. We are saying that whatever P1 is storing the address, we want P2 to store the same address as well. Consequently, we are actually going to have P2 also pointing to the same objects. All right? This is the most crucial line for today. If you don't really get this line, there's no way you can trace the later code. So guys, please, if you don't understand what I just said about this line, ask. Everybody's good? Okay, somebody is smiling. That means you, you're good, right? I presume, not the other way, right? All right, assuming that you're good for this line, and if we do some check, P1 equals equals P2. True. And the way to see this is, are P1 and P2 pointing to the same objects? Yes. So this one should be true. If you're asking if P1 and P2 are storing the same address, di diagrammatically, are they pointing to the same objects? Right? That's basically what you're asking. So think about these and these are consistent. Okay, one more. How about this? Well, we're creating a new object, right? So let's do that. P3, oh, let me use a slightly different color if I may. P3 is pointing to another object because I got new here. And just the same template being instantiated. So I got X and Y, and in this case, Two and three. Okay? 
And let's just do what the page is ask, asking us to uh, try, and I'll do one extra line together with you. Okay? And then we are ready. Let's try this. P3 equals equals P1, true or false? False, because they are pointing to different objects. That should be false. P3 equals equals P2, false. Very good. You guys can read the diagram. So false or false is going to give you false. That's fantastic. Let's do one more. How about that? P3 dot x is referring to this. Equals equals P1 dot x, true. P3 dot y, P1 dot y, right? True, right? So true and true is going to give you true. So what we are really doing over here, uh, the third one can be exercised for you. Here, we are really comparing the addresses. So here, we are comparing the attribute values. So we're doing different things, right? Just to show to you. Guys, one more line. Extra. What if I say, P2 equals P3. Hopefully that wouldn't cause your brain to spin, right? I hope. It's not too bad, right? So we are, <laughs> before, basically we are here, we are trying to assign whatever that's stored in P3 into P2, agree? Now, how should I change the diagram? Am I right? If I try to say P3 is now going to point to wherever P2 is pointing to. Yes or no? Let me say that again. After this line here, I'm declaring that P3 is not going to point to here anymore. It's going to point to wherever P2 is pointing to. Yes or no? Yes, no? Be, be sure. No, right? Yes, that's no. Yeah, I, t I told you I will try to mislead you in every way I can to make sure you really understand, right? It's no. Because P2 is being reassigned. So P2 should not be pointing to here anymore. So P2 should not be pointing to wherever P3 is pointing to. All right? That's very, very important. Not this anymore, but now it's going to point to wherever P3 is pointing to. That's aliasing. If you have been following through up to now, you're ready to do that exercise, all right? I got four minutes. How about this? I will suggest. I'll do one more preparation exercise for you. This one here, let's trace it together. That one hasn't really involved any aliasing yet, but that one just uses a similar code structure. Let's say we do this in class today, and then, you try this exercise, which I already posted on the site before Tuesday, and we'll go over a solution to start with. You can wait for my solution, but it will be even better if you can try it yourself to see if you really struggle. And by the way, don't use Eclipse. In a, on the written test, you cannot use Eclipse. All right? Let's now trace this code together. Yeah, three minutes should be good. All right? Let's do it together. Let's go line by line. Line number one. Integer i1 is 1. i2, integer i2 is 2. Line number 3, integer i3 is 3. Well, trivial. But what about this line here? How do I trace it? It's an array notation. I'm creating an array called numbers 1. What's the size? Three, right? One, two, and three. Index zero should be storing I1, index one should be storing I2, and index two, et cetera, right? The way to visualize it would be numbers one is pointing to the beginning of an array of size three. Index zero, one, and two. And the value should be I1, I2, I3. I1 is one. I2 is 2. I3 is 3. Right? This will be useful when you trace the code in the reference alias in K. That will prepare you for that. All right? How about second one? Numbers 2. This one's slightly different notation here. We are creating a new array objects of type integer, right? 
right? That's an array. And then I'm saying that that array should be initialized to be the same size as numbers one dot length. What's numbers one dot length? Three, right? So that means this one should be three. So what, you're, what we're doing here is numbers two is pointing to the beginning of another separate array. And then we got indices zero, one, and two, right? And what should be the values? No value, getting somewhere, but not exactly. It's not no value. Zero, 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 why? Default values, right? We haven't initialized anything just yet, all right? Zero, 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 default. All right, so now we gotta do this. Oops. We have a loop over here to run through. Let's, let's try. You know what? It's not 1120. I shouldn't delay you. How about this? We will start from here on Tuesday together. But at the same time, please try to trace it through yourself to see how you can trace a loop. That's a nice exercise. And do this one as well. Thank you so much. I'll see you on Tuesday.